Well, thank you again for the privilege of being here and the joy of that, that it is uh, to my wife and to me. Uh, we are also a campus of the Expositor Seminary, and so that's grace upon grace that uh, uh, Smedley and I get to serve with uh, some other wonderful men uh, in that ministry uh, as we seek to, to train men to serve the Lord and to serve His uh, church. So it's been a, a really refreshing day for uh, it's a refreshing weekend, really, for us to be here. So I invite you to turn to this book in the Old Testament. It's Second Chronicles, uh, specifically chapter 20. Or if you're standing out in the hallway still, it's the 10th panel from the left, the 6th column from the left of that 10th panel. It's the only church that I know where I can say something like that. It has the Bible in the, in the lobby. It's wonderful. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Just a, a reminder about the nation of Israel. I mean, obviously, this is part of its history, what we're going to be studying tonight. And, and we're familiar with God's chosen nation, His one and only chosen nation and His redemptive plan. They, they faced a lot of struggles along the way. And probably the greatest one that comes to mind is the challenge they had in Egypt when they were in bondage there for those years and serving Pharaoh. And uh, then God, you know, uh, brings all the plagues and they're released from bondage, but then they, they get out there and what are they facing? The Red Sea, this insurmountable problem. What in the world are they going to do with the Red Sea before them and the Egyptian army behind them coming after them to recapture them? So we know that was a very important moment. And it's a great example of God's protection of them and how he uh, helped them escape miraculously that challenge of the Red Sea. Well, that was not the only challenge, certainly, that the nation ever faced. We're looking at one tonight. Long after Israel had actually stood before the Red Sea, which seemed to be an impossible situation. There was another time later when all the people living in Judah, which was the southern kingdom, and their king, a man named Jehoshaphat, they were facing a situation that likely made them feel like once again, here they were, standing as it were at the Red Sea, metaphorically, facing a situation that seemed to have no human solution. That's the event we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's the account of the time when Judah faced an invasion by hostile nations that lived uh, around them. Now, before we look at this event, just a few comments about their king, this man Jehoshaphat. First of all, Jehoshaphat was the son of King Asa. Asa was a good king relative to some others, and we have to say that when we talk about the good kings of Israel, really, because even those good kings had some glaring blind spots in their thinking and in their behavior. But overall, we would conclude that Asa is in the column called a decent king. You find the record of Asa's reign earlier in this book, back in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Let me just read you one statement summarizing statement about his reign. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2. It just simply says, Asa did right, good and right, in the sight of the Lord his God. Mostly he did. Interestingly, though, chapter 15 tells us that some of the people who lived in the northern kingdom, called Israel, the ten tribes to the north, they defected to the southern kingdom of Judah when they saw that God was blessing the southern kingdom. Now, there was a, a hiccup in Asa's reign. You find that in chapter 16, one of those blind spots. We don't have time to go into it tonight. But in chapter 17, we do find that his son, Jehoshaphat, succeeded him. And Jehoshaphat was also a relatively good king. Look at chapter 17 of 2 Chronicles, a couple of summarizing statements in verses 3 and 4 and 5 of chapter 17. Verse 3 says, the Lord, that's Yahweh, was with Jehoshaphat. And it gives you the reason in verse 4, because he sought the God of his father 
followed his commandments and did not act as Israel did, the northern kingdom. Verse 5, so the Lord established the kingdom in his control. But like a lot of the good kings, he wasn't perfect. And so in chapter 18, there's a hiccup. We unfortunately find Jehoshaphat aligning himself with Ahab, the king of that northern kingdom of Israel. Ahab was someone who really didn't love the Lord. And yet Jehoshaphat aligned himself with Ahab, chapter 18. Chapter 19, there's this man named Jehu who confronts Jehoshaphat about that, about aligning himself with Ahab. So it was a debacle in Jehoshaphat's reign. It was unfortunate, but Jehoshaphat did learn from it, and he did respond properly. So look at 19, verse 4. So Jehoshaphat went out again among the people, and look what it says. He brought them back to the Lord. And that sets the stage for what we're going to look at tonight in chapter 20. It's a narrative. It's a story. We're going to walk through this narrative section of the Old Testament, and we'll divide this drama into six scenes tonight. Now, scene number one is something that happened about six or seven years before Jehoshaphat died. So we're going to label it this way. Scene number one, the unexpected threat. The unexpected threat. Verse one. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon together with some of the Meunites came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Now this was unexpected. This invasion, it was a combined force of three different groups. It mentions the Moabites and the Ammonites. Those were their neighbors to the north more to the north. And the Meunites were an Arabic tribe who were headquartered in Edom, which was more on the southwest side of Judah. But these armies formed a coalition, and this coalition planned to invade Judah with the purpose of driving out the people of God from their land there. Now, it was some of Jehoshaphat's people that brought him the shocking news of what was about to happen. That's verse 2. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming up against you from beyond the sea out of Aram. That phrase, a great multitude, just means this was a, a vast army, and the point is an army much larger than Judah's army. And this advancing army was using this little-used route around the south end of the Dead Sea there. The point of mentioning that is it's where Judah was less defended. Now, they had likely heard of the riches of the temple in Jerusalem. And they knew that the people of Judah had been flourishing for years so they were going to come in in this great horde to kill and to destroy and to plunder, to take these riches, this unexpected threat. We come to the second scene of this drama, the singular hope, the singular hope. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid. Now, he did the math. He knew they were outnumbered. But he also knew something else, and that is where to go for help. Verse 3 goes on, and he turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. That term seek means not something weak. It, it's a very settled seriousness. It's, it's the idea of fixing your heart on something. So the point is that ultimately Jehoshaphat was intentionally putting his trust in the Lord in this situation. And he called upon the people to fast. That was a way to express their, their humility, or more specifically, their humble dependence before God on the Lord. And so they, in fasting, sincerely pleaded to the Lord for his help. And it's what all the people did. They pled to God for help. Verse 4, so Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. They all understood the seriousness of the problem. They all knew that this enemy was enormous and that the case was hopeless on the human level, hopeless as far as they were concerned, if they're only going to talk about a military battle. 
So they prayed. And their king, Jehoshaphat, led them in that as they gathered in the temple. I want you to see this prayer. This prayer divides into five different acknowledgments on their part. Let's look at these acknowledgments. First, they acknowledge God's sovereign power in their prayer. Verse 6, and he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. What are they confessing about God? They understood that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful, and he rules over all things, and he exercises this sovereign rule in great power and in great might. So this was essentially an expression of their confidence in God's ability to help. No one could stand against God if it was God's will to move. And notice that Jehoshaphat used Yahweh as the name of the Lord here. He's calling upon Yahweh, he says, the God of our fathers, the, the ever-present God, the covenant-making God. He gives reason why God should protect his people in that present distress because God had already done that in times past as Yahweh. He had proven his power in generations past. He had proven his might. He was the same God in Jehoshaphat's day as he is now in our day. They acknowledge God's sovereign power. Here's another acknowledgement. Second, they acknowledge their past blessings which in their case meant the gift of the land, the temple. God had promised that to Abraham, to Moses, David, Solomon. We know, look at verse 7. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name. So he says, since Yahweh had given the land of Canaan to his people Israel for an everlasting possession, and since Israel had responded by building a sanctuary to God's name, it only seemed right that God would take care of the nation as he had done in the past so that they could continue to enjoy all of this. In other words, Jehoshaphat was trusting that God would not now, after all of that, forsake his people. So they acknowledged their past blessings from the Lord. Third, verse 9, they acknowledge what God had already promised. Now, in this case, they actually recited an excellent summary of the Davidic covenant, the promises associated with the covenant made with David. That's back in chapter 6 and 7. And that covenant that God made with David included God's promise that he would always hear their prayers offered up in the temple that they built unto his name. So look at verse 9, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword, or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and we'll cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. It's their plea. Should evil come upon us, they pled. You know, that's basically what Solomon prayed at the temple's dedication. We don't have time to, to look at it, back in, but back in chapter 6, verses 28 to 30, they're, they're repeating some thoughts from that. And then back in chapter 7, verses 13 through 15, we find God's promises to answer that kind of prayer from his people. So Jehoshaphat is essentially pleading with God by saying this, God, what I'm asking is for you to do as you have promised you would do. They acknowledged what God had already promised to them. Here's a fourth acknowledgement in their prayer. They acknowledged their terrible circumstances. They didn't mince any words. Verse 10, now behold, the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade, you know, when they came out of the land of Egypt, they turned aside from them and did not destroy them. 
See how they are rewarding us now by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. This means that Jehoshaphat believed that the invaders were wrong to do what they were doing. Because in the past, God had shown grace to these very nations. He protected them when Israel was beginning the takeover of the promised land. And yet, in spite of God showing grace to those nations, here they were invading the Israelites. And that could mean only one thing to Jehoshaphat, that if God did something back then to show grace to nations like this, God would show even greater grace to his own people now. So they acknowledge their terrible circumstances, but lastly, they acknowledge their need for help. This is such a great verse, verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming up against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. What a great expression of weakness. What a great expression of their total inability to change their circumstances. They knew that God was the only one who could accomplish anything in a situation like this. They didn't know how, how the help would come. They didn't know when. They didn't need to. They looked to God anyway. Verse 13, all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. Can you visualize that scene? Desperate people with their families there, all pleading to the Lord. I think having their children there increased the sense of the danger that they understood that they were in. It stirred them up to even more fervent praying. God was their singular source of hope in this situation. That moves us to the third scene, the encouraging promise. The encouraging promise. Start at verse 14. There we find that the Lord sent an answer to Jehoshaphat from an unexpected source. It was through a Levite whose name was Jehaziel. Interestingly, he was a descendant of Asaph, the chief Levitical musician, Asaph one of his descendants, Jehaziel. Verse 14, then, here they are, praying. Then in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. Verse 15, here's what he says. Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. That was a welcome reminder of the Lord's care. It was a welcome reminder of the Lord's sovereign ability to perform his will, regardless of what the challenges are. And this is a reminder of what is true in every single circumstance we could ever face. The answer is in trusting the Lord's will trusting that he is working out his will in providential dealings, the providential dealings and actions in this world. The specific way God is going to work is not something we can necessarily know, and that was true for these Israelites. They weren't told specifically everything that God was thinking. They're told that God is active. They're told, told that God is doing something. And what God would do would become evident the next day. Verse 16. Jehaziel says, tomorrow, go down against them, and you'll find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. Just so you'll know, that wilderness was this high table land it was along the Dead Sea, just 
Kind of get that in your mind on the, on the left side, the west side of the Dead Sea, this high table land that was essentially a wasteland. That's where they are. So Israel went there. They went to meet the enemy upon this high table land, but not to fight. Verse 17. You need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. So notice the repetition repetition of those important instructions. Do not fear. We saw it in verse 15. Here it is again. Don't be afraid. And that is such an important point for us to glean tonight. God began helping them first by calming their hearts so that they did not fear. Calming their fears, you could say, so that they were not, they were able without fear to face whatever it was that might come. I want you to think about that for a moment, how often it's true that God gives deliverance to us, not so much by changing circumstances, but by quieting us. Angst is a good word. We don't use it very much, but God removes the angst in our hearts. So make that personal. Have you ever been in a situation where it's obvious that there's just nothing you can do? Something in your family, something in your own life, something related to the world at large. It's in those very situations that we don't need to fear. We can have calm hearts, even in the situation, just like they did. The encouraging promise. Here's the fourth scene. Let's call it the proper response. The proper response, verses 18 to 20. What did they do? What was their response to hearing all this? In a word, they worshiped. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verse 19, they stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. 20, they rose early in the morning, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Listen, this is where the spiritual battle is fought in our lives. It's in whether or not we genuinely trust God in difficult times. And notice something significant. This was their response before actually seeing what God was going to do. They didn't have to see the final answer. Before that, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with a face to the ground. Before that, Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Before that, they they stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with a very loud voice. That is what God demands of us. Here's the fifth scene, the shocking discovery. Verse 22, when they began singing and praising, they don't know what's going to happen yet. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. I mean, if you ever wanted your your smartphone on video, it's now. I mean, picture that. Here are the Israelites marching out, supposedly to battle, doing what? Verse 20, singing, praising. Now, no doubt the enemy could hear them coming, singing and praising. I mean, these people had been in battles before. This is un- incomprehensible. I mean, what kind of defense strategy is this? I've never, we've never seen this before. 
The invaders were expecting a fight. I'm sure they couldn't figure this out at all. I mean, the armies weren't rushing into battle in the normal way. They were marching, singing hymns. What kind of new style of fighting is this? And evidently, it greatly confused them. Now, we don't know exactly what happened. But somehow, all this confusion led to a mistrust of one another. So it manifested itself in the invading armies destroying one another. I mean, two of them are looking at the third one and going, that third one is doing something funny here with the enemy. They've arranged something. Let's kill them. And then the two tribes that are left, the nations that are left, look at one another and say, no, I think it's you. And they kill one another. Now, the bottom line is we know that it was God who stirred up all this confusion amongst the enemy. So all God's people had to do was look at what happened. Verse 24, when Judah came to the lookout of the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude and behold, they were corpses lying on the ground and no one had escaped. Didn't see that coming. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found much among them, including goods, garments, and valuable things, which they took for themselves more than they could carry. And they were three days taking the spoil because there was so much. So Jehoshaphat, with his people, found them all dead, but also found all the wealth that they had brought with them, evidently. These nations had gone forth with all their property because they were intending to drive the Israelites out and then stay. They were going to take possession of the land. So Jehoshaphat and his people went around and collected it all. Shocking discovery. And that brings us to the last scene of this great drama. Number six, the appropriate conclusion. The appropriate conclusion. Then on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, they have named that place the valley of Baraka until this day. So there was a valley near the battlefield is the point. And they began to, to bless the Lord. So they gave the name to the valley to recognize that, the valley of blessing. That's what the valley of Baraka means, the valley of blessing. Then after that, they went home. They joyfully returned to Jerusalem, went up to the temple to render more thanks to the Lord for his help. Verse 27, every man of Judah and, and Jerusalem returned with Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. Something interesting as I studied this section of scripture, I found that many Bible scholars are agreed that they believe that the song that they sang as they marched back was Psalm 47, which, which makes sense. Here's a few excerpts from Psalm 47, verses 1, 2, 3, 6, and 8. O oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with a voice of joy, for the Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. Verse 6, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Verse 8, God reigns over the nations. You certainly can't imagine them singing a song like that after this experience. Well, word definitely spread, verses 29 and 30. And the dread of God was on all the kingdoms of the lands when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God gave him rest on all sides. That's the story. We just marked our progress along the way to help us capture sort of the flavor of the scenes. But for me, I'm always looking for what can I learn from this? What are the implications for me, our church, you? For me, there were several reminders that I got from this. So let me share them with you. There's eight of them. My conclusion is longer than my sermon. And we'll still get out on time. 
Here's eight reminders. We, we ought to glean these reminders. Here's the first one. It's the reminder of the priority of prayer. Let's just start there for God's people. In all of our difficulties, in all of our anxieties, our dangers, our fears, our burdens, our perplexities, it doesn't matter whether they're public, some are, some are private. Our first response as God's people should be to seek him in prayer. They did that. Now, we know what Paul writes to us as the church in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in some things, the things you can't figure out on your own, pray. No, it doesn't say that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're told to pray, and when we do, the peace of God will guard our hearts. It doesn't say because we get an answer, it's the prayer. It's giving our burdens to the Lord is what brings the peace, whether or not we see an answer or not. It should be our first response, and yet sadly for many Christians, prayer is the last resort or no resort at all. So remember this scene, Jehoshaphat and his people were helpless. So again, ask yourself that. I'm asking you that. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Are you in one right now where you don't know what to do. And you sense that you are powerless to change anything. Then pray. In every situation, we should be known as those who are constantly seeking the Lord in prayer. We're reminded of that here, the priority prayer. Second, we're reminded of the encouragement found in remembering. There's encouragement found in remembering. Remembering what? What God has done. Jehoshaphat did that. When he began seeking God, he started mentioning God's past acts. That is a powerful encouragement. Remembering what God has done for us. Let's think about it. You're here. He's brought you through things. We, we have found him so many times in the past to be good, to be faithful to us. We have found God to be true. We have found God to be gracious. We have found God to be patient. So in a time of difficulty, it is right to do what they did. It's right to come to the Lord and humbly but boldly say, God, I, I know you. You are my God. You're the one and only true God. You have delivered me before. You have brought me up out of the miry clay of my own sin, the Egypt of my sin, if you will. You've never left me. I know you won't leave me now. And I know that it's not because I'm worthy, because I know I am unworthy, but I've been unworthy all along the way when you have helped me. All those past times, you had plenty of reason to let me go. You had plenty of reason to abandon me, and Lord, you've never done that. So here I am again, Lord, coming to you, the only true source of the help that I need. I'm just saying Jehoshaphat did that. He asked God's help by first recalling the past, so I think there's a place for imitating that. Here's a third reminder. It's the freedom we have to be honest with God. I, I love that as you read the Psalms, especially the, the, the transparency is the word we use today. You know, The psalmist would, would honestly articulate his, his dire circumstances to the Lord and his sadness, his burden, his grief. And so the people of Judah did that. They articulated this terrible situation and condition. I think of Psalm 3 as well when I think of that. David had fled Jerusalem and the throne because his son Absalom had stirred up the nation against David and was leading them against the father, his father, the king, and trying to usurp the throne. We're going to kill his father. And he's escaped with a handful of loyal 
people, except maybe his most loyal one, Uriah. You know, he had him killed. David did. But he's out there in Psalm 3, and he starts off, and he says, you know, boy, our, our enemies are great. I mean, they are all around us. We are completely surrounded. And everybody's telling me there's no help from God. We, we can be honest with the Lord. In a sense, there is even strength in being truthful with God about our circumstances and our condition, truthful with how we feel, what our fears and anxieties are. I mean, he knows them anyway, so you might as well articulate them. Great quote from Spurgeon here. I can't be here this weekend without quoting Spurgeon. So I think I have two quotes from him. A long one. Listen, when we have no strength, neither know what to do, we come and just lay the case down at God's feet and we say, there it is. Our eyes are upon thee. Spurgeon says, perhaps you think that's not praying. I will tell you it is the most powerful form of prayer just to set your case before God, just to lay bare all your sorrow and all your needs and then say, Lord, there it is. So Spurgeon writes, so go, lay bare your sorrow before God. Just go and show your soul. Tell God what it is that burdens and distresses you. God's not moved by eloquence of words, but is swift to answer the true eloquence of real distress. So we honestly state the difficulty that we're in. And I think there's a practical reason for that. And this is why it's beneficial. Because it makes us more prone to watch for what he's going to choose to do. You sort of leave things in an ethereal, general way, and you sort of live your life in a general, ethereal way. But boy, once your antennas are up, this is what I've laid out before the Lord, then we watch, and, and no matter what he chooses to do or how he works in our situation, we're going to more readily remember our former condition, and we're going to more readily recognize that here we are, and somehow God has brought us through it. So it's helpful. There's encouragement found in remembering. Here's another reminder. It's the benefit in reciting God's promises. There's benefit in that. In our prayers, reciting God's promises, it's not allowed. It's helpful as well to say that, Lord, here's what you've promised. And I do believe you are true to your word. I believe you do what you say you're going to do. Now, of course, today we don't get new promises from the Lord. He's given us all we need, the promises in his word, the scriptures. So learn them. Repeat them to the Lord, the very things he's promised. God, I, you say in your word that, that you overturn things, you, you work things for good. For those who are called according to your purpose, you use things to conform us to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you would do that. God, you've promised that you do not allow your people to suffer more testing and temptation than what they're able to bear. But you give us the strength to endure, so I pray for that. You've told us, Lord, that if we humble ourselves before you, you give grace, and that you confirm us and you strengthen us at the right time. I'm just saying, learn the promises in God's words, repeat them to him, the very things he's promised, and that ends up strengthening and comforting you. There's benefit in reciting God's promises. Another reminder, this certainly reminds us of the true help that we need. The true help. What we need most in times of difficulty, whether we know it or not, okay? What you really need the most, no matter what you're facing, is to be saved from the fear of the trouble. Not so much the trouble itself. You need to have your hearts quieted, calmed. You need to be rid of the anxiety or the fear, even if the circumstances don't change. Because the trial itself ends up nothing if the sting to our hearts, to our inner man, 
so to speak, is removed. To say it differently, if your heart is not troubled, then your trouble is not so bad. When you wake up in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, and that trouble is like a monster that fills the room and hangs over your bed. It's the trouble of your heart that's the biggest issue. And I was so comforted by those words from Jesus in John chapter 14 to his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. It doesn't have to be. We're reminded here that this is, this is a great need we have. This is, this is really the true help that we need. Another reminder, it's our obligation to worship. In our prayer about the trial or the burden, we need to always be remembering to give the Lord the adoration he deserves, the glory he deserves, the praise, the worship he deserves. And that worship also strengthens us as it did them. And I stress the timing of that because the timing is significant. <clears throat> I mentioned to you that they worshiped before they saw what, was, what God was going to do. And so before the answer to the prayer comes, before the deliverance comes, praise him. Praise him for what is coming. Thank him for what he does because what he does is always good and right and just. Thank him for what he's going to do regardless what it is. Spurgeon comments on that, that it's, it's especially sweet to the Lord, that kind of praise. Listen to this. He puts it so well. Though still the fig tree does not blossom, and still the cattle die in the stall, and still the sheep perish from the folds, though there should be to you no income to meet your want, and you should be brought almost to necessity's door, still bless the Lord, whose mighty providence cannot fail and shall not fail. Your song, while you are still in distress, will be sweet music to the ear of God. We're reminded of that here, this obligation to worship. Seventh, it's a reminder of the sovereignty of God as always. I mean, what's happening here in this story is one of many views of God working out his redemptive plan that he formed in his own eternal mind, protecting his chosen nation to fulfill his promises. He's a sovereign God. That's what he does. And applied to us, there's a sovereignty we need to understand when it comes to his prayers, our prayers to him. We, we have to keep something in mind. That as a sovereign God, his answers can take more than one form. And basically, I, I, we might be able to flesh this out a little differently, but in my way of thinking, there are four basic answers that God has to our prayers. He does answer every prayer. And the four basic answers to our prayers are these. Yes, he does exactly what he's put on your heart to pray. Or, no, that is an answer, you know. Or, not now, but later. Or, different than what you've asked. Perhaps even better than what you ask. God is sovereign over that. He works out his purposes and his will. That's why Christ prayed in the garden. Here's what my prayer is. Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, your will be done, Father. It's a good model for us. The answers are part of his sovereignty. And one more thing, the timing is also part of his good hand. His timing is wise, his timing is, is just, his timing is good, his timing is perfect, which again means we must trust him. This is a great reminder of the sovereignty of God, and he's trustworthy. So maybe one more. I mean, certainly it's a reminder of the priority of prayer. Don't forget that. The encouragement we find in remembering all that God has done for us in the past be honest with the Lord. 
He knows your heart anyway. Recite his promises, know his word, speak that truth, not as some sort of magical claim, but you're articulating what the very things are that God has said, that he's faithful to, his word. And keep in mind the the real help that you need at the end of the day. Though you want the circumstance to change, I get that. But even more than that, change me. I'm convinced that's the biggest benefit of prayer. What changes is me. My heart ends up being aligned with his purposes. We're reminded of our obligation to worship no matter what, whether we see what he's doing or not. We must keep in mind the sovereignty of God to trust him, but this is a reminder as well, as many passages are, it's a reminder of the need to know Christ. Now, we're many years away from this when it happened in history. It is right for us to say this, that if you've never trusted Christ, then whatever implications are here and whatever that is true about God and his purposes ends up really then not applying to you, not in the way you would want. His sovereignty is expressed in his sovereign judgment and his wrath against your sin. And when it comes to the trials and, and the battles of life, well, you are on your own. You, you fight your own battles. You do have to bear your own trials. You do pretty much have to carry your own burdens. And frankly, I can't think of anything worse than going through life like that. You've said it before. You, you've seen it when Christians suffer and you suffer. Someone in the church goes through a great trial or loss or tragic situation. We think about that, how God gives grace to his people, but those who don't know the Lord, how do they make it through these times? What a horrible way to live, not knowing Christ, fighting your own battles, and then coming to the end of your life and the, and the, the last great day of the, the judgment bar of God and having to give an answer for your sins. And not only have you borne all your own trials along the way, but now you'll bear your own punishment. You need God to be merciful to you and deliver you from that condition. It's a bad condition to have to live in, but it's the worst condition to die in. But if you know Christ, if you've come to receive Christ, you've entrusted yourself to him, trusting in in him alone, the perfect life that he lived and the the death that he died in the place of his people. You, you, You trust in him and who he is and what he's done for the forgiveness of your sin. And you 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 rest in that and not self. And you can have the assurance that, you know what? He is my God. He is my heavenly father, not just my judge. And he will help me through every one of these times of seeming despair and impossible circumstances that his will will be done and I can trust him. And when I go to heaven, when I die, I'll go to heaven and be with him forever. Let's pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this incredible drama. This, these scenes that, that really happened so long ago with you, the sovereign God, working out your purposes for your people. And Lord, we recognize that you work in a variety of ways. It's not a, a cookie cutter form, but everything you do is right. Everything you do is just and good. Everything we experience is from the hand of a good God. And you are perfectly faithful and trustworthy. So, Lord, thank you, if nothing else, for the important reminder that we are to live our lives as being those people who are characterized by prayer. Not living in despair, but rising out of that despair and giving our burdens to you, our anxieties to you, casting them upon you so that we can experience the peace of God that guards our hearts regardless of what you do. May we be faithful to pray. And Lord, we confess sometimes we don't know what to pray. 
Maybe it is just the angst of our hearts that it is all you see because we can't even seem to verbalize it. But Lord, you're so gracious to hear our hearts. We love the promise that even the Son and the Spirit praise the perfect will of God on our behalf. So Lord, may we be known as people who are dependent on you in every way and not self-sufficient, but trusting in you. In our Savior's name, amen.